gonna get started if we're feeling ready. My name is Shiera, and I'll be your host this evening. Welcome to the Booksmith. If this is your first time in, if you've already been in before, welcome back. Um, to intro George, without further ado, we're so excited to introduce fine artist, illustrator, and graphic designer who's worked with national magazines like Ready Made, Mother Jones, and Entertainment Weekly. George McCalman and his stunning debut illustrated Black History, honoring the iconic and the unseen. George's breathtaking collection of 145 portraits of Black History, oh, sorry, Black History pioneers coupled with insightful biographical scripts. If you haven't read it, you should check out George's piece in the Chronicle, which gets into more of the mental, physical, uh, and spiritual work that went into creating this beautiful work of art. Without further ado, welcome and show some love to George. Um, hi everyone. Hello, hello. Uh, this is never not going to be weird sitting, <laughs> watching an audience filled with some people I know and some strangers. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much everyone for coming this evening. I'm terribly excited about this book, this offering. Um, it's all very new for me because I've been working on this for several years and the book itself just came out on Tuesday and so I'm in the throes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And so I'm still kind of uh, caught in the ripple effects of basically people seeing it and touching it and having an experience and then reflecting that to me. And um, it's been wild. It's been really, really wild. So, um, so part of this evening is um, I've gotten a lot of questions about the process and the making of this book and basically how I put it together. I spent a day in a marathon, 12, 13 interviews um, all across radio stations across the country and got a lot of questions that kind of mirrored the layers of complexity of this book. And so one of the reasons that I have a lot to say about the making of the book is that I am the writer, artist, and designer of the book. And that is a very kind of uh, unconventional thing. Most writers don't design their own books. Uh, most writers would not want to design their own books. And so because it is, I run a design studio that is my day job. Uh, I have worked for myself for the last 11 years. I've been based in the Bay Area for 23 years. It's a long time to be here and see the many personalities of the city over time. It's been fascinating watching San Francisco change and change and change again and then change again. Um, and so very much living in San Francisco uh, affected my approach to making this book. And, um, and so I wanted to share a little bit of the backstory and um, and once I run through this presentation, feel free. I love open dialogue, so ask me any weird, interesting, grounded, substantive, wackadoo question you have for me. I've, I've heard most of it, and I love talking about this stuff, so f don't feel awkward about asking me anything. Um, so, Ethan, thank you. So the origin story of this book is uh, a little bit of pleasure, a little bit of pain. Um, I was in my early 40s going through a little midlife crisis, kind of searching to find myself, who am I? At the time, I'd been a graphic designer and an art director for a lot of years, but I was thinking that there was something more. I thought there was an artist living inside of me. And so I assigned myself uh, a, a a month-long practice of painting black history pioneers. I was just curious. It was my own curiosity. It wasn't, didn't come outside of anyone else. I, I, I am a reporter, and so I'm often thinking 
about stories. I'm often thinking about series. I'm always thinking about how things are packaged, how stories are told. And so this was an opportunity for me to explore as an artist the parameters of what making something like this could be. The very first portrait I did was of Edna Lewis, the culinary legend. And uh, the second one I did the following day was Gordon Parks. And uh, my friend Rachel actually wrote a story that came out in Alta magazine today uh, because she had a ringside seat to it. And, um, and she kind of described the emotional aspects of the portraits. And one of our mutual friends ended up calling me the first week I was doing the project. And she said, you, number one, I didn't know you could do this. And number two, you paint emotionally. I can see your emotions in the lines, in the squiggles. I can see, and, and your emotions mixed with the subject is producing an emotional response in me. And I remember thinking at the time, oh, I didn't realize anybody else could see that. I thought that that was just what I knew about my own work. And so that started a whole process where after the project was done, several people said, this should be a book. And I just assumed that it already was. And then I discovered that it was not. And outside of children's books and historical uh, tomes, academic uh, renderings, there was no book on black history that you could just find and buy and uh, share. With the, with the community, and, and at first I was really genuinely surprised, and then I was not surprised, and then it was like the seven stages of grief, you know, it was like anger, resignation, depression, I, and I, I really did, I ran through a gamut of emotions, um, and then I decided to pursue the project, which led me to my agent, Kate, and I remember talking to her and really getting angry about the, the lack just the lack, this book not existing in the world. Um, and she said, let's, let's go for it. And so that, is, that was the start of this, of this saga and journey. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Kate Woodrow, I'm totally breaking a script. Amazing, 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 amazing. Thank you. Um, so the actual making of the book involved a lot of conversation, a lot of consternation, a lot of construction, a lot of deconstruction. The process stopped and started and stopped and started uh, many times for a lot of reasons, but it was ultimately a very iterative process because I had the opportunity to really think and rethink what I was doing with this project. I really had the time to get to know the subjects, the process of selecting the subjects. I had a list of 500 names initially, and then I decided to start winnowing them down. And even that itself, in and of itself, was a process. And uh, the word that I use uh, often today was, I was looking for avatars of a particular strain. And so I wanted people to really represent the range of what it meant to be black. I was looking for people in different periods of history. I wanted, there were a lot of criteria. I wanted to make sure that it wasn't too kind of, um, there wasn't too much East Coast people, too many West Coast people. I was really trying to make sure that there was a, a, a just a swath of folks who moved through the country. Some folks who weren't born in the country and came to the US and defined uh, culture and what I was looking for just overall were people who had unique stories to tell or someone that we all knew but I was interested in a s different aspect of what they uh, had to offer and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is actually one of the perfect avatars of this because uh, Kareem, Ab Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is not in this book because of his accomplishments as a basketball player, as a legendary basketball player, which alone would qualify him. But what I was interested in Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was that he was uh, and is a writer and a really gifted writer. And you wouldn't know that he's written uh, six or seven books. 
And he is a really brilliant cultural critic and scholar. And what I loved about his story was that sports did not define him. That he, claim, he came to play, he claimed it, he left, and he continued with his life, and he continued being brilliant. And that's ultimately what I was looking for. People who divide, defied convention at every turn, had insurmountable op obstacles, and still defined what was extraordinary about each of them. And every single person in this book is not average. They're extraordinary people. And so the process of making the art, process of writing the book and the process of designing the book was difficult. It was just only difficult. And difficult in the way that, you know, on the inside of making books, it's really just about production. And what production means is that you're in the trenches. It means that it's all the sexy stuff that you can't, unsexy stuff, you can't show on Instagram. You can't show all the hours of meetings and conversations and ferreting information from one department to another and setting up meetings to solve problems, to um, have conversations to deconstruct problems, have meetings to make problems. <laughs> that happens a lot too. Uh, and so, so that is just, I've been doing this for so long that it is just about solving problems on a daily basis. And it's so, the process behind the scenes can be so tedious sometimes. It's just not even interesting to talk about it because you're just in it and you're, and you're setting up your meetings and you're s talking on the phone. But the art itself was a dream from the beginning to the end. It is the spine that took me through the entirety of this process. It was the only thing that was easy the whole time. And it is the thing that frankly kept me in this project. Because there were many times I did not think this project would see the light of day. And just getting to sit and commune um, and as you will see when you open the book and you look through it, it looks like 17 different artists did, um, did this book. Every single pioneer is rendered in a completely different style. And that was not intentional, but it was emotional. Like after I did the first few portraits, it became clear that I had a different perspective on each person and that every time I was starting a new portrait, I was actually starting the process all over from scratch. And that I wasn't always sure what tool I was gonna use. I used every conceivable tool known to man, one of, and woman, and others, and everyone. Um, I, one of my favorite portraits in this book, just because it tickles my funny bone, is um, John Coltrane is rendered in Sharpie. <laughs> You wouldn't know it from looking at it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's in the seas. <laughs> um, and it was rendered in Sharpie on the cheapest kind of craft paper that you can find. And to me, when I was finished, I cackled with laughter. And my studio mate, who basically is the person who saw every single piece as I was making it, I just, to me, I looked at it and I said, that's jazz. It's, it's, it's just taking the remnants and it's riffing. And every piece, I can tell you a personal story about the underlying symbolism that was there after, you know, most times after I was making it because oftentimes making this art, I would fall into just a fugue state and I was just communing. You said that you're a perspective, so I have one. Please, jump in. Mm -hmm. What do you think we miss having it translated to a book versus seeing it in gallery? I just love these questions because, <laughs> yeah, this is what I want people to be thinking about also. So I'll skip to the end of, the end of my answer, which is that this book was conceived first as a fine art show, mm -hmm. and it will be a fine art show. <laughs> and so this is, this book is actually, it also, it, triples and quadruples. There are many different things that this book is, but it's also an, uh, it's a fine art catalog. And so it is a catalog before the show. Um, and that was part of the strategy of this book also. This is part of my original outline that I wrote 
four years ago and, and spoke to um, with all of the publishers I was, um, I was engaged in conversation with. And so what I wanted was for you, each of you getting this book, to be able to see the actual art. And the art is rendered all, you, you'll see all of the, you see the folds and the bends and, and you know, even the creases in the art, I decided to leave a lot of that in. And you can see it, it might look like there's a line on someone's face, but it's actually just the paper. Um, oftentimes the paper itself was the skin color. And it was hearkening back to, you know, the paper bag rule, you know, back, back in the days where people were judged on the color of their skin against paper. <laughs> you know, that, that's, how, that's how debasing <laughs> everyday life was for, for a lot of people. And so, um, so I decided to use all of that. You know, uh, George Washington Williams, uh, he, even though there's painting in, in the background, his skin color is actually the paper underneath. And I did that in some cases. Uh, Gregory Hines is one of the, uh, that was on cardboard. And I painted on cardboard. And it, it, it matched what his skin color looked like. And so I decided, I found myself just using and utilizing. You know, most of the skin color in this book is actually painted or drawn or, or colored in. But there are a lot of times where you're looking at it and you won't know it until you see the actual art, that it's the paper that is, that is the background, that is the tone, that is the underlying layer uh, of, and so I was playing with all of these conventions. It's basically the entire history of how black people have been treated, seen, rendered, dismissed, celebrated, just all of the complexity of all of the emotions. I wanted that also expressed in the art. And so because of that, it just took a while. It took a while to do because I was, I, you know, there's some that took weeks to finish and there were some that took hours to finish. And so I was constantly kind of moving in between one state of being uh, and another. Um, I to I've told the story a few times. The I don't have a favorite in this book. And every time someone asks me, I was like, that's a dumb question. Please don't ask me that. <laughs> I, s I said that in the interview, in one interview today. I was like, don't, don't ask me that. I'm not, I'm not going to. I'm too close to this uh, at, at this point. And, and that's a lazy question. Um, and and, and I, I, I mean no disrespect with that. I was like, I have spent too much time on this to give this kind of, to give a flat answer like that. I was like, you tell me what your favorite is. I, we, can, we can talk about that. Um, but I'm, I'm too close. But there is one piece of art that stayed in my studio for two years. And in a lot of ways, she became the patron saint of this book. And it was the portrait of Dr. Maya Angelou. And she was in my studio so much that there are a lot of photos of me basically sitting under <laughs> her <laughs> in my studio. And she, I was really inspired by the time that she lived in uh, California. She, she lived in, at Berkeley. And the time, that time was a very formative player in how she spent the rest of her life. She was really influenced by her time in, um, in San Francisco. And so you can see here, even then, it was, even as I was working on several pieces, uh, sometimes at the same time, they all had completely different tools used, perspectives, renderings. Some were painted from start to finish. Um, this one of James Baldwin is with colored pencil. Because one of the things I was asking myself, I was filtering through my own sense of growing up black and having a sense of our icons. You know, I had never seen a photograph of Malcolm X smiling. But everything I've read about him, people say that he was really funny. <laughs> and so even though Malcolm X is not in the book, I have several portraits of pioneers to basically say, your favorite celebrity is not in this book. Um, but the rendering of Malcolm X is of him laughing. And that, to me, 
is, you know, we forget that the people, the public people that we like, don't like, are challenged by whatever are people. And so what I wanted to do was show that this man had a whole world of existence outside of our, our uh, cultural rendering of him. That he's someone who, who had a completely different way of, of living. Um, and with James Baldwin, he was funny and very impish. And I wanted to create something where he almost looked like a pixie, you know? He looked like a little, you know, uh, otherworldly science fiction figure where, you know, there are like 17 different colors in this. I just kept picking up different pencils. And if your eye follows it, it looks like a continu continual line, but I was so, I had just like a sea of pencils and I would just grab and continue and then put down and then grab. And this was all within a couple of hours. And then I decided to stipple the background, you know, because clearly I, I have extra time on my hands. <laughs> and and there, were, there were always times where my studio mate would come, would walk in, and she'd see me kind of, you know, detailed. She's like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? That you'll be doing that for days. And oftentimes, I was doing it for days. Um, Thank you. So uh, one of the themes in, in the book, there are obvious biases that I'm always happy to declare. Uh, there are more women in this book than men, just because that's my vantage point and that's my view. I, my family is a matriarchy and I grew up with women being the bosses. And so I, I have a natural deference to, uh, to women as leaders. And I was, interested in profiling several women who were alongside more famous men. Uh, Marcus Garvey had a, a two wives and his first wife, Amy, they were actually both named Amy, which you know I'm sure his therapist would have had a field day with. <laughs> uh, but Marcus Garvey's wife, Amy Ashwood Garvey, um, I think is far more interesting than Marcus Garvey. <laughs> um, she was a really world, she was a worldly, smart scholar, traveler. She lived in Liberia. She briefly had a relationship with the Liberian prime, uh, prime minister. And she was, and she was fearless. And I think in a lot of ways, like he, Marcus got a lot of his ideas from being with her. And, and so I wanted to focus on the stories that we don't hear, you know, because I always was like, who is she? <laughs> I hear a lot about him, and he's he's making some moves, but who who is the smarter person next to him? Uh, and so that's how I found my decision making in a lot a lot of these cases. You know, um, Kathleen Cleaver was someone who Angela Davis, you know, commands a lot of attention, but I. I was more interested in Kathleen Cleaver in this book, even though I, I worship at the feet of uh, Dr. Davis. I was actually more interested in the more kind of ground floor aspects of the Black Panther Party. And so, and also the, the drama of the Black Panther Party. It was a lot of juicy, <laughs> everyday life. There was a lot of drama behind the scenes. There was a good Netflix on like who was married to who and sleeping with who. and. <laughs> And they were, they were doing the thing while taking care of the community at the same time. And so uh, those were just kind of giving a sense of the psychological backgrounds to some of my decisions. So I worked on this book for four years. And, and then it, it, it wrapped up a few months ago. I remember it going to the printer and actually talking to the pressman the day that it went on the printer on, on on press, and we'd had a conversation about some color that I wanted adjusted, and 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 I was involved in every. I mean, this book is just my, is my decision making. I decided on the paper. I decided on the and and the publisher Judith Kerr has just been astonishingly uh, consistent. <laughs> There were a lot of people who weren't consistent in this process. Judith ha has always been consistent with me about the desire to have this be an art book in addition to a cultural artifact. 
And she knew that my standards, that I was really clear about what I wanted this process to be. And my editor, Elizabeth, is a former magazine person. And so she knew the dynamism of me, of the continuity of me needing to be t speaking to all of the people involved in the process. And so um, I remember uh, getting the color and sending it, sending it finally, having my markups, and then talking with the pressman the day it was supposed to go on press, and he was like, we're gonna take care of your baby. <laughs> and, and we understood each other. And this, was, this book was printed in Tennessee, by the way. Tennessee, which is currently doing the most to erase books like this. And, I, and the pressman was a very white gentleman who understood how important this was. And we were speaking as designer to press person. And he knew that I understood everything in his language. And there was just a shared respect of how we were treating this material. And I will never forget how clear and, and transparent he was with me, with understanding that I knew what I was speaking about, and he also knew that I knew what I wanted. And so I got off the phone with him, and I remember just thinking, okay, now I can relax. Now, I wouldn't have been able to relax if someone had given me that information, but I got to hear it from myself, he got to hear it from me, and then, you know, a couple months later, I received a box a few weeks ago, and I opened it up and it was filled with five copies and I ugly cried myself to sleep. I did. I, I have no, no issues saying that. And it was a cumulative six years of the, the screen of my mind just running through all of the events that got me to this point. And last weekend we held a gathering of over a hundred black people that, um, that I wanted to share it with the community before it went out to the larger community. And it was a spiritual gathering. It was super emotional. Um, it turns out that one of my friends, da da uh, f one of my friend's friends is the daughter of J. Max Bond, who is one of the people in this book. And she left this gathering and took it to her. And she sent me a photo later that evening of her open looking at J. Max Bond's photo and just, and Constance was like, she loves it. She is really happy with how you rendered her father's story, life, and likeness. And that is, that is just basically the last couple of days. I got an email <laughs> last night from Dick Gregory's son. <laughs> And it turns out that the publisher, Judith, um, saw him a couple days ago, handed him a copy, and he was so moved that he wrote me last night. And this is the, the kind of continuity we were talking earlier about this book actually impacting people's lives in really kind of unexpected ways. And this is what you always hope from a project like this, but the truth is, I didn't know. <laughs> I'm not going to lie and tell you that I knew what the response was going to be, but I h had hopes. I didn't have any expectations, but I definitely had hopes. And to see how just in the last couple of days, it's, uh, it has been overwhelming, basically, what I have heard from people, received from people in emails and calls. Um, it's just a couple of days fresh for me and so it's a very new thing receiving this feedback to this thing that has been just incubating with a few people for a few years um, so one of my favorite parts of this book are actually the end sheets which are the end papers which is the page that when you first open a book and the very last spread um, is filled with all 40, 145 names of all of the people in the book rendered in individual typography to befit their uh, individuality. And it was an idea that I had. It was one of the last things that I did um, as I was finishing the cover. And 
it was something that I hadn't thought about until I thought about it. You know, I thought initially that I was going to do something else for the for the end sheets. And it was something that just kind of came to me in a flash. And I came down. Everything that you see there is in one sitting. There is no adjustment uh, aside from like an accent. And, uh, or, you know, I would misspelled one pioneer's name. And thank God for for copy, copy proofers. And that's their job to catch all of those things. We made that change and there is no other adjustment. So all the color is as, and I have, I have the notebook that I rendered it all in. I sat and worked on it for a few hours, and then it was finished. And then when I popped it into the layout, it just like it had been there all along. It fit the shape perfectly, and then, it, we were, and then I was done. And then that was one of the last things that, um, that happened before it was sent off to the cover printer. And so, it's still one of the things that when I open the book, I can see it's one of the few things that me as the maker of this book can see the totality of it on two pages. You know, everything else you have to turn and turn. It's, and I think about the two dimensionality versus th the three dimensionality. When you all come to the fine art show when it's in San Francisco, it's, it's the place that you will be able to see all of the work in one sitting. You can't see all the work in one sitting. It's, it's deceptive, books are. Like you have, all, you have all of it in a package, but it's also not the whole thing. You have no opportunity to see all of these if, unless you ripped out all the pages and laid them on the floor. It's the one opportunity you have to see the entire thing. And so I'm looking forward. This, this is what that represents to me is I look at it and I can see the entire thing that I've made in one sitting. And it, it, still, it fills me with, um, with a happiness that I didn't know. And I'm a design nerd. It's like the little things that I'll turn the page and it's like my soul is like, okay, that's good, that's good. <laughs> that's, that's real good, that's real good. Um, and so this is some of the gathering just a few days ago, uh, filled with the most celebratory, and when I tell you there were tears, there were tears. It was a really emotional gathering of people who felt seen. Uh, so this was at Blackbird Books, which is in the Outer Sunset. And the reason this bookstore is very important to me is it's a few blocks from my art studio, which is out by Ocean Beach. And I have a very luxurious position in, in that I have a studio that has me connected to a part of the city that is one of the most spiritual places for me. And so I spend a lot of time on Ocean Beach, and I have for years before I started having a studio out there. So it was a particularly poignant way to kick off this public facing experience for me and to have the people there who looked like the people in this book <laughs> that was also uh, was also there to see themselves in this book in this part of town and the symmetry and symbolism were uh, really potent Um, the lesson, very simply, is um, I've, been, I've been asked a few times in the interviews, what advice would you give, uh, which I find fascinating, uh, what advice would you give to people trying to make their, you know, entering into making their own books? And, um, and I say this with love. I've been in, I've been in design, in publishing since 1995 i have made printed things and so i am a lifer i'm not going anywhere but i tell you in all seriousness it is not for the faint of heart you have to have stamina you have to have endurance and it's and it's it's a it's a truism just to say i mean there are warriors on the inside of publishing and i've I was in magazines first, and now I design a lot of books. I see some, similar some similarities. They're very different fields. Um, one is far more sustainable than the other. Um, but the lessons that I tell people are 
just me as a black person, I am still one of the few in the fields. I'm still one of very too few black designers that book publishing hires. There are plenty of black designers um, out there. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, but one thing that I, I say to people is um, I had to really get clear with myself. And this team that has worked with me knows that I have been completely clear. Um, and I had to work on that within myself. At no point have I, have I asked anyone, anyone, on the publishing side of this for validation for what I'm, what I'm doing. And at no point have I asked for their permission either. And that's a really important thing because if you're looking for that validation, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> Because the, the process isn't really built for that. It's, it's a factory in a lot of ways. And, and, and in, the be, in the best possible way, there are people who are really clear about their roles, who know what they're doing, who are part of the ecosystem. And they're counting on you, as the author, to have a clear sense of what it is that you want for them to aid you in the implementation. And so thankfully, I have always been clear about what this thing is. And I was clear with it long before I even had my first conversation with, with Kate. We ended up talking about three different ideas. And this was the one that she was like, that's it. And I was hoping she would say, <laughs> that's it. And so every conversation we had with anyone outside of just the two of us, it was just me talking them through how I saw this. And, um, and that's what, so the advice that I have is that you really have to trust your instincts. If you're not sure about your idea, then why should anybody else be? Just in life. <laughs> and and that's, been my, that's been my own personal uh, and professional philosophy. Um, and really, um, I just put a lot of my own time. I, I have put an insane amount of my own time. For the last four years, I have been working seven days a week. And I have a full-time job. At no point did I take a sabbatical <laughs> from my day job to work on this. So I worked on all of this, all the components of this book, as I was also fulfilling all of my client obligations. And what I learned is pacing. I learned patience with myself. I learned patience with other people. and. Um, and I kind of kept coming back to myself, just kind of like, how am I feeling about this? Is this working? Am I sure? Am I not sure? Just really trusting, trusting, trusting yourself. This is one of the portraits. And, uh, and there are several portraits in the book that are either diptychs, where there are two different aspects of people's lives. Langston Hughes is another another one, and, and it's not by accident that these are two gay men also. I wanted to show the evolution of the young and the, and the older, or in Baldwin's case, the more scholarly, and then the imp, the elf, you know, to show the two sides of, because that's also in his writing. <laughs> you know, he has a really playful side in his writing. He can also bring the sermon and you know, take you up to the mountain. But there is a, a playfulness in his wordplay also that I wanted to show that in his body language and also in the uh, color sensibility. This was one of those where it was just divine provenance. Like I thought when I first started painting, I thought I was gonna give him a face. And then as I kept layering more paint, it became clear that the paint itself was forming his face and that, and that it was his style of painting that I was communing with. And as I kept painting, it just became clear that the way that I was painting it, it would stay. I thought that this was the underlayer. And there's, and there's a lot of layers in this, um, in, this, in this piece. And I just kept layering more paint. And then at at one point, I remember just stopping and realizing that it was, it was finished, it was done, and that there wasn't anything else to do. Uh, this was a piece that I did of Aretha Franklin years ago, and before I even started this project. Uh, 
the very first year that I was uh, illustrating, I started doing a column in the San Francisco Chronicle. And I would go to various cultural events and the same way that you have photographers documenting these events, I would draw the people that I saw. And the column was called Observed and I would have I would have a notebook around me that was like a security blanket. And I would, and uh, there are actually two people in this room that I've drawn at events. Um, and I've done so many of them that there is inevitably someone I have drawn at some point at almost every event I go to still to this day. And I was doodling one day because I would s just sit in cafes and draw in between meetings while I was waiting. And, and I mean, I don't mean like two hours of drawing, I mean like 15 minutes. And just like, you know, just having a little time and the choice was either having a muffin or drawing for 15 minutes. And I would always decide to draw for 15 minutes. And I did this rendering of, of Aretha Franklin and I remember just feeling, and it was with ballpoint ballpoint pen and you can see it here where I spent days I spent days on her hair and I think this the subhead of this book in invisible ink should be um, George's love of rendering black hair <laughs> because I would to get the texture just right and the difference between one person or another I would spend hours or days just getting the texture just right and making sure, and not like rushing through the pointillism, just taking my time with each dot to make sure that it felt. Um, and so this was in that, and as I was, and I hadn't considered it for the book. And so I was gearing up to, I had like a daily list, I had a log that I was keeping track of. and. I remember sitting down to, to paint her. And then in that moment, I realized that I actually had the portrait already. But I didn't remember where the notebook was. <laughs> and so I tore up my apartment trying to find the book. Because at that point, I had like 10 of these notebooks that I'd just been walk running around and drawing. And then I found it. And I mean, that's, that's why it's here, because I, I found it. Uh, but it was one of those stories where I, I sat down to do a portrait, and I realized that I had already done what I needed to do, that I had already created it years ago, and that it was exactly what I wanted to say about her. Um, this was one of those paintings that, I mean, artists are not supposed to say things like this, but I'm going to say it in, it's a small enough crowd that it won't get out too much. I remember when I finished this piece, I was like, damn, this is good. <laughs> and I, that's not something that I, that I said, that I said very often. I was very critical of the process as I was doing it, but I would just wildly loved this piece. Um, it was the paper, it was the painting. There, there's, there's so many different things in this piece, it's hard to, for me to even describe how many different tools I used. And this was maybe a week of working on this one portrait where there's so many different colors that I use for her skin. There's so many different layers of paint. I use paint, pencil, pen, um, there was just a, a lot of different tools and w I remember stepping back from it and getting a little bit giddy because then it, it, it was also taking on a kind of surreal. Um, a lot of the portraits were starting to become abstract in a way that where it was representati representative but there was something else going on. And I remember just getting really excited because I was giving my per myself permission to try a lot of things that I, if I had thought about it, I probably would not have rendered it this way. And it was one of the portraits where early in the process, I looked at it after I was done and realized that her eyes were alive and that she was staring at me. And she had been staring at me illustrate her 
which is which is a, a really kind of spiritual thing that happened several times in this process where after I did their eyes I realized that they were staring at me and that I was actually having a conversation with them as I was finishing the rendering um, or the or the painting or the drawing uh, yeah Thank you so much. This was really, just really delightful. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, ask lots of questions. Yes. negativity about blackness. Oh, sorry. Did you hear the first part of that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, I'm curious as to how in your life and in, even in representing things in this book, you've explored those contradictions of power and oppression when we think about blackness in the United States. Well, I, I will tell you, one of the things that was upfront in this process the whole time is that I, it just, it, to this day, I am tickled that I made this book in one of the whitest cities in America. I, I was just kind of like, and, and also in one of the whitest neighborhoods. <laughs> and you know, my studio mate and, and I would talk about this all the time. You know, there were so many of these conversations that were in my everyday existence around this book. I, there were a few people that I just spoke to religiously about the political, social, cultural implications of what I was doing and also how I was doing it and where I was doing it. Um, you know, there are a lot of other neighborhoods I could have gone to. You know, my studio, I have another, st I used to have another studio in, um, in the Dog Patch, which is closer to the Bayview. I could have got, had a studio over there. I could have done, rendered that there. But it was actually more important for me to be by the ocean. That was what was calling to me. And to answer your question directly, I, you know, I had every reason to not do it here. You know, that the whole, you know, white spaces thing is, that's just where we are, you know? It's, it, we live in the United States. We are black people existing in white spaces. And we do it so often and effortlessly that they don't think about it. We're always thinking about it. We're always thinking about a lot of things that the larger society is not. And I think that that has given me a superpower. You know, I come from, I'm originally from the Caribbean, so I grew up mostly around black people. And I lived in New York in a neighborhood that was mostly black and Caribbean. Um, and I knew, I remember writing a list when I got the job that brought me out to San Francisco. I made a list for myself of the pros and cons. And I remember, and I still have the piece of paper. It was, I don't want to be the only black person in any room I'm in. And that is at the genesis of why I founded the Black Brunch Club. I was like, I deal with that enough at work. I'm still often the only black person, even though a majority of my clients and my working compatriots are black. Um, I am still, in the making of this book, I was often the only black person um, in meetings, like all throughout the process, entirely the process. And me getting clear with myself is a response <laughs> to being the only black person. I, I don't mind it now because I, I have more than enough of a balance with that, that it doesn't feel aggrieved. And one of the main reasons is that I don't work in the corporate world. I work with corporations, but I will never work for a corporation ever again. And, and me getting clear with myself about that gives me the freedom and the levity uh, to say what's on my mind. I, I, don't have to, I don't have to worry about offending people. I, I, I've been doing this a long time. I'm really good at what I do. And when I'm speaking my mind, it's coming from a place of experience and rigor and discipline and, and freedom. And so that's what I would encourage as you're teaching children, that it, yeah, the, the context of their environment matters, but it doesn't always have to paralyze and it doesn't always have to get in the way. Yeah. 
Next question. No questions, no questions, no questions. Yes. <laughs> we could do this all day. <laughs> could you tell us a bit more about your artistic process? Would you start a piece and finish it? Would you start multiple at a time? Do you do the eyes first, the eyes in the middle? You're talking about the eyes and feeling like you were in conversation with the person you were drawing. Just tell us a bit more about that process. The answer is yes. <laughs> no, and that's, that's really no, um, no exaggeration. You know, I have been an art director for a long time, and that means that I spent, I've spent a majority of my career working with artists and basically directing illustrators. Uh, it's a lot of the illustrators that I know are just delighted that I'm doing this because most people I worked with didn't know that I could do this until six years ago. Um, and I had pretty much forgotten, <laughs> quite honestly, that I could do this. So, so the doing it and being immersed in it and it basically driving everything that I'm doing right now is quite unexpected. But it is very lived in because I, I am an artist. I started drawing as a little kid. You know, I was the kid who drew all my notebooks. I, I was an ex obsessive um, drawer <laughs> as a kid, as a teenager, I, I, always in the margins, you know, in science class, making up superheroes and <laughs> having them pose and fight and pew, 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 pew. <laughs> um, that, was, that was me. So starting my practice, at, you know, 44 was, I had no, there was, I had no sense of what was wrong. <laughs> so when I tell you that I do it always, all the time, and that it doesn't matter, I have, there are a lot of artists that they, it's, you have to line up and you got to do this and you got to, I will just pick up a whatever is there, and uh, there's a piece of paper over there, and then it's finished. And so I have no formality around it, which I'm really, really happy about, because it means that I feel a sense of freedom in what I'm doing. Uh, one of my favorite pastimes is to sit at bars and draw people in li live, and I draw a lot of live. It's a lot of art that I do is, this book is very unlike uh, yeah, I, yeah, I can say that. This book, ironically, is unlike how I like to illustrate because I had to use other people's reference. And I don't like using other people's reference. And this is why I say I'm not a real illustrator because if I had to do that for a living, I wouldn't do it. I don't like working from other people's reference. And, and I put that aside to do this. But when I am out in the world and I'm drawing, if I'm taking reference, it's my reference. Even when I illustrate for magazines, I tell them don't send me their reference. I will get my own. Because I'm, it's, I am often looking for, because I'm a designer, I frame a composition before I start drawing. Most illustrators don't do that. It's my, it's my background as a designer. That is why this book looks the way it does. If I was an illustrator, an artist, and only an artist, this book would look completely different. Completely different. Um, it, it is, you know, and I, I illustrate backwards. You know, I, if I were to show you how I painted a lot of these, you, you would laugh out loud. Like I, most artists, most illustrators draw the lines first. I draw the lines last. And so I do the underlayer first. And so I have no idea what it's gonna look like even as I'm working on it. I'm just trusting my, it's, it's just the somatic language of it. I just trust that my paint falls where it needs to paint. And I, I have to admit, I often don't know how things are gonna turn out. And, th and that is the truth. When I was doing, you know, when I was doing my monthly column, um, my ex-boyfriend would catalog how many times I would cackle <laughs> with delight. <laughs> and I do, I have this like, when no one else is around, I have this like guttural kind of like tee hee hee when something is finished and it looks like the moment that I saw. I'm just like, yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> 
she was dressed like that and she looked like that and her body language was like that and I'm just transported back to the moment that I saw first. That is the thing that I'm trying to create. I am rarely trying to recreate from the image that I see. I always change what I'm, if I'm using reference, I always change it because there's something, that I, a snapshot that I've captured in my brain that I'm going back to that I'm trying to create the emotional moment that I witnessed. And so that's, that's how I illustrate. Thank you. Yes, yes. Does anyone else have any, any questions? questions? Yes. I'm really curious about, when I see in your studio and when you were talking about um, that this will be an art exhibit. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about, like I'm imagining your studio getting flattened into a book um, and I'm wondering if you intervened in a way to make it be what it is in the real world or if you just were like this is the book version of it oh you mean compared compared to the the show well because when I'm seeing all of the things that you've been doing to create this mm -hmm. it feels very um, alive and vibrant and then when I picture it being put into a book I wonder how that translates, and I was curious if you did things to make it happen in the book, or if you were like, well, this is the book version of what I've made. You know, the, the, the truth of the answer is that it was in between those extremes. I was thinking about it, but the, kind of the process actually revealed that. And because I'm a designer, I knew what these things were gonna look like. You know, it's funny, people say I'm a visual person, what it means that they're not visual people. <laughs> <laughs> I am someone who does not need to see the visual to know what it's gonna look like because I've just been doing the pattern of repetition of being a graphic designer, being a print designer, means that you can anticipate okay. a lot. You know the variables, you know when okay. it can go off here, or, oh, but you have a, a clear sense of the line. And as I was working on these pieces, I'll tell you the first time I knew how the book was going to look is I had done like the first five. This was early in the process, like the first year. And I was still settling into my studio and I had a couple pieces and I put them up on the wall and I saw how different they were. And I knew that that was that that is what that was, that the book was going to look alive because all the styles were distinct. That's not something I could have plotted. That's not something I could have anticipated until I saw it, and then it was clear. Then I moved forward four years mm -hmm. and knew you know, when I opened that box, because one of the things I said to myself is, to myself, you were right. Mm -hmm. And it was a conversation with my past self. It wasn't a conversation with anyone else, and it wasn't about anything else other than that. The thing that you saw four years ago, and now that it's printed, yes. <laughs> you were absolutely right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, George. Hi, Kate. <laughs> um, okay, so now that you've been the author, is it gonna change the way that you would art direct or design somebody else's book? Like now that you've been the one doing the work with your name on the cover, how does that inform your process as an art director and designer? Uh, that's a fantastic question. It, it already has. Yeah. Years ago, it started affecting. Um, I've been designing quite a few books lately, and I've been focused, uh, I, I'm focused on cultural things in general, and I've been designing cookbooks the last few years, not because I wanna design cookbooks, <laughs> but because I'm designing cookbooks for a lot of first time black authors. And I'm there as a guide and a steward. That is actually, the design of, of it is almost, I mean, they'd be surprised to hear me say this. It's, it's secondary to me because that's easy. Designing a beautiful book is easy for me. Uh, but what is hard, it's navigating publishing while black. And so I made it a mission a few years ago. I designed a book that came out last year called Black Food. And that experience really taught me 
that my role was there as a steward and a translator. Even though Bryant has designed, has uh, authored, this is his fourth book, the truth is, it was his first book. Moving through this process in this way, and he installed me basically as the, as the creative director, just across. So basically, I was the one implementing all creative decisions in, in the process. And he gave me uh, the autonomy to set up the process. And even the 10 Speed team was, they were incredible. They had never worked this way before. That basically I installed a production schedule where every week, and for months we did this, long before. <laughs> and it, it, what it did is it cut the inefficiency of email out and it allowed everyone to organize their thoughts and everyone came prepared to contribute and to move the process forward. And so we all gathered to solve problems. And this was in 2020 we were making this book. So, so um, and we did the book for exactly a year. So, which is a tight, tiny window in, in the glacial strata of, of book publishing. Book publishing takes forever. As a magazine designer, I'm gonna say this until I die, forever. <laughs> Yes, but I also can tell you, left to my own devices, this book would have been finished a lot sooner. Because my process, just it, within myself, I move fast. You know, I, I know how to make decisions. I've designed a lot of things quickly by myself. But when there's so many other people involved, it just is not, that's just not how it goes. And I'm totally fine with that. But, um, but Black Food was exactly a year, and that's like no time to do, and it was one of the most thoughtful, considerate, just a career highlight. It was a fantastic experience. And it was also Bryant's first time working with a black team. It was his first book with that experience. When I tell you before then, all of his photographers have been white, his editors have been white. He, and it was the first conversation we had where he was like, there was a photographer attached to the process uh, who was white, and I was like, absolutely not. And I remember just like stopping traffic in the middle of the production meeting. I was like, I am absolutely set against this. <laughs> and we'll have conversations with it, but I'm, I'm unraveling this process right now. And, and I said to Brian, I was like, you are going to underscore, you're underscoring your own agenda. There is no point. I was like, there are a ton of black, there's, uh, there's no excuse. This is the mission statement of this book. This needs to be a black team putting it together. And it, you can have no gray area about this. It is, we have to be, and, and the whole team has to be absolute about it. I'm not asking us to have this perspective and then the white team on the inside. I was like, nope, I'm saying this to all of you. So you all understand where I'm coming from. I said, we're starting that process from scratch. And, and that's what we did. And so at various times, I had to make that call because I was also representing an outside cultural perspective. And so, you know, kind of honoring the, c and I've said this in this process, I say this with all of the book pro projects. Books are not just books, they are cultural artifacts. And especially since publishers are starting to embrace books outside of the conservative um, collection of books, it is more important. <laughs> it is way more important for everyone on the inside to be having these conversations about what it is we are actually doing. Like, what is this book for? Who is this book for? And if it's actually for the people that we're talking about, then a lot more research and time has to be put into representing the underlayer of the cultural aspects of whatever the book happens to be. So it, it has absolutely, I would say three years ago, I just turned my attention, I was, uh, it, and it's stuff I've always thought, but I started actually just speaking up about it and actually just stopping traffic when I see that it's not being attended to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have time for one more. Anyone else feeling expired? Beautiful. <laughs> feeling inspired. <laughs> I was feeling inspired. 
Uh, so as a recovering perfectionist myself, I'm curious if during your creative process, like you toil and toil and eventually have to just let it go and be like, it's good enough. Or do you, do you sit in that moment until you're like, no, it's done. That's what it's supposed to be. With, with the art? Yeah. Never. And I, I, this is one of those things where I, I, I'm, I wouldn't say this in a group larger, but it feels intimate enough to say, um, there were no pieces I had to redo. They were all done. There were a couple cases I did a couple different portraits. So I, I ended up doing two, there were maybe five pioneers that I did a couple of portraits and then had to decide which one I wanted to use. Um, Henrietta Lacks, I was talking about this today. Uh, in the book, she's rendered as basically a continual line of DNA. <laughs> And, and it's, not, it's not clear that that's what it is, but that actually is, is what it is. And when I, it was one of those like emotional responses I had when I finished it, I started laughing uncomfortably <laughs> because I could see the symbolism immediately and I was like, this is out there. <laughs> this is out there and I'm not sure that everyone's gonna appreciate <laughs> um, the kind of cosmic, twisted humor in in the tragedy of her life uh, but it felt like she was kind of encouraging me to <laughs> to do that and I felt so uncomfortable with it that I did a whole separate portrait that was more traditional and it was like her in a dandy outfit and she looked amazing and then I, I finished it and I put them both up and I was like it's not even close it's just not even it's not even close there were a few that I did that I did uh, another piece of and then just didn't. But at no point did I second guess. There was, I, I mean, the portrait of Dorothy Height I did early in the process. And I wasn't crazy about it. And I didn't know why. And my assistant was like, and it still is one of her favorite portraits in the book. And then it was like I had to see more of them to see where she fit in. And then I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> and I think I just hadn't done, it was one of those things where the process had to reveal where she fit in, in terms of the style, in terms of the rendering and, and, the, and the personality and the emotion. And then I saw it. But I'll tell you, it took me about a year. You know, that piece was up there and I was like, oh, I'm gonna get back to it, I'm gonna do another one. And then one day I turned the corner and saw it and I was like, oh, there you are. <laughs> Hi, Dorothy. And she was like, hey, how you doing? Took you, <laughs> took you forever. <laughs> she was like, took you a while. Um, so yeah, with making the art, nope. It was the smoothest. I've never been in this kind of creative flow ever with anything I've ever done and, or might ever do again. It was just always, I just always knew it. And they would tell me when, when it was done. And, and then that was it. Mm. Yeah, fantastic question. Thank you. All right, Thanks. everyone, thank put you. your hands together thank for you, George. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. And thank you so much, yes. George. Yes. I, I, I have just one more thing to say. Yeah. Because these guys have heard me say this ad nauseum. I want this book to be in every home in America. A a anyone who's just buying a copy, I'm just like, weren't you raised to share? Because you're not going to want to give it to anyone. So everyone, I'm just like, you're, you're cute, but it's at least two copies. So, so that's it, thank you. You heard him. 